Hello everyone and welcome back to Mass Communication 100. This video will uh, focus on chapter one, which is about books and the publishing industry. Now you don't have to be a bookworm like me to find real value in learning about books and the publishing industry because books were one of the first forms of mass communication. The printing press allows us to reach out to new publics, so it really establishes the groundwork for future technologies of mass communication, like radio, television, movies, et cetera. In addition, media convergence really uh, heavily relies on books in the publishing industry. Uh, for example, you may never have read The Duke and I, which inspired the Bridgerton series, but the books often uh, create what we expect for other industries like television or movies. And so it's important for us to look at books and the publishing industry as we consider the effects of mass media on our culture. Books are extremely influential. You may not be a big reader yourself, but it's important to recognize the power of books within the mass communication field. Americans actually went to the library more often in 2019 than they did to the movies, uh, to live music, theaters, parks, or museums. So books have a large impact and influence on our culture. In terms of who reads and who doesn't, there are lots of demographic factors that, that um, kind of play into this. This graphic from the Pew Research Center actually shows who does not read books, uh, who hasn't read one in the past 12 months, according to a survey. So you can see that the majority of adults have read a book within the past 12 months with uh, women reading slightly more than men, uh, whites reading most in the racial and ethnic groups with uh, Younger, younger people actually reading more than older people and economic factors uh, playing a part as well as education factors. So you can see that uh, books still remain a primary way that people get information and entertainment. Now, the influence of books has grown dramatically over time. In 1778, there were only 461 titles available for sale. However, as of 2017, when, these, um, when this information last came out, you can see that more than 2.2 million titles are put out per, per year. So books are the oldest mass medium available and uh, we spend a lot of time reading them as you can see in this graphic from Statistica. The United States is a very influential publisher within the book field. Uh, other countries uh, such as China and Russia and England are also very influential. However, there are many areas that are still lagging behind globally in terms of publishing. And book consumption is also continuing to grow, although we've seen slight declines in recent years uh, for ebooks in particular, while uh, audiobooks and um, print books actually continue to climb. So uh, you can see that the publishing industry is actually on an uptick, especially given uh, COVID-19. And we will talk about some of those figures in part two when we discuss the industry and business of publishing. <laughs>
if you haven't visited Disney World and haven't gotten to experience Spaceship Earth, which kind of walks through how culture and history has developed over time, I figured I would give you a little history lesson from Disney by bringing you on the ride with me. So as you just saw from that video, uh, one of the major developments in terms of written communication and publishing was the Egyptians' creation of papyrus in uh, 2400 BC. This method was then adopted by Greeks and Romans uh, later on. Moving from papyrus, uh, people started to write on parchment, which was treated animal skin. This was a popular mode of writing in Europe, uh, particularly because it was smoother than papyrus, it was more durable, and it was less expensive because it didn't have to be imported uh, from Egypt. Paper was originally invented in China uh, using many different techniques, but it didn't replace parchment in Europe until the 13th century. Now, the first proto-modern book was actually developed in the fourth century uh, by Romans who were using a codex system. Uh, this is when you uh, sewed pieces of parchment together, uh, binding them with thin pieces of wood that were covered in letter. So this kind of created the first book uh, that allowed writing on both sides of the page and allowed it to be bound in a copy. In the Middle Ages, uh, Christian clergy were uh, responsible for really the development of manuscript culture. Uh, a lot of uh, religious text was put down in these illuminated manuscripts that were lettered, decorated, and bound by priests, monks, and scribes. This meant that uh, the priests, monks, and scribes were really among the original gatekeepers in the publishing industry because they got to determine what information could go in books and what information had to stay out of books. And that really shaped both the religious world as well as the publishing world. These illuminated manuscripts are illustrated books for the church uh, or wealthy clients. And it's really interesting to think that a lot of the original scribes within the Middle Ages were the dictators of what punctuation would look like. They invented lowercase and capital letters, spacing for ease of reading. So a lot of the uh, grammatical rules that we have um, within various societies were created thanks to this manuscript culture. Block printing uh, was originally developed around the third century by the Chinese at where you would try to print an entire page by carving the letters into wooden blocks, putting uh, ink or some kind of transferring material on those wooden blocks, and then pressing them onto a page. This obviously took a very long time, uh, but the oldest dated printed book was uh, China's Diamond Sutra, uh, which was created around 800 uh, AD. In 1925, however, the um, traveler Marco Polo introduced this technique in Europe, which really was the catalyst for uh, print and, and publishing. In 1000 AD, uh, the Chinese actually developed movable type by creating the wooden letters at, um, on the wood and then moving those letters or Chinese characters for their culture around uh, so that they could be then transferred. So again, um, this development occurred in Europe in the 1400s, um, but you can start to see that we move away from using an entire wooden block to now we have these movable characters that can be moved around. And that led us to the Gutenberg printing press. And Gutenberg combined the principles of movable type and a wine press to create the printing press. It was, uh, it was the first time that mass production of printed materials became available, creating the first modern books. Now, Gutenberg is famous for the Gutenberg Bible. He created 100 and 180 copies of the Latin Bible. 21 copies still exist today. Uh, in fact, I'm going to take you over to 
the Library of Congress. And they actually have beautiful archived images of uh, one of the Gutenberg Bibles, uh, which is held there. So you can see the meticulous nature of the Gutenberg Bible and how well it's actually held up. Uh, but Gutenberg's press was the very first uh, to, to use this, this uh, idea. Chaucer's uh, Canterbury Tales became the first English work uh, printed as a book, and really the Gutenberg printing press was the advent for the publishing industry because it made books smaller and cheaper, uh, which allowed for wider distribution to the masses. And once Gutenberg's printing press allowed for more books to be distributed out to the public, this led to people being able to think for themselves individually outside of oral communication culture. And this led to many revolutions around the world. Now he has to have something to hold the paper against the tympan. It's called the frisket. We fold it down. It's cut out there where we're going to print. And it also allows us to lift that paper back up off that sticky type without tearing it or smearing it. So now we're ready to fold the tympan and frisket down over our inky type. Ready to roll the whole net of the press underneath the platen. The platen is this big flat board that's going to lower to press the paper against an ink type. Now the press has this screw device, the flat board, and the handle that turns the screw and that's going to lower the platen and press the paper against the ink type. The person that did this was called the puller. And so we're going to make an impression here. Now notice the size of the platen. It's really quite small because the bigger the platen is, the more power it takes to get sufficient impression. And so we've only printed the first page there. So we've got to roll it out to print the second page. paper off that sticky type and it does make a sound. You can hear it come off that sticky type. Ready to open up the frisket and take our printed sheet off. So that's actually a demonstration from a museum curator of one of the original Gutenberg printing presses. So you can see how it worked there. Now, as I said, uh, the printing press really had large implications for many societies, including American culture. In colonial America, the first colonial book was the whole book of Psalms. Um, and although at the time there were only 3,500 families in uh, colonial America, um, there were uh, 1,700 copies of this book in America at the time. So you can see how widely distributed this became. The first American novel was actually reprinted by uh, Ben Franklin. Uh, it was Samuel Richardson's Pamela or Virtue Rewarded. And in 1747, the book Clarissa was put out, which connected with the middle class and many women. Um, and it was really one of the first times that domestic life and um, female virtue were discussed in print, and it became a way that uh, colonial women were able to kind of read, begin thinking for themselves, and it led to a lot of the concepts of women having, having equal rights within society. Now, paperback books became popular in America around the 1830s. By 1860, paperback dime novels were being sold. The first uh, you can see over here was Ann Stevens' book. Um, and by 1870, over 7 million copies of these paperback dime novels were available. Um, in 1885, a third of all books printed were these paperback dime novels, and they were pulp fiction. They were cheap, machine made, very uh, easy to use, um, easy to read, and, and were kind of just entertaining stories. So we move from printing being very educated and having to have a high degree of thought and reading level 
to now being able to have these very cheap novels that are entertaining and it moves it away from just being purely education based. Now the linotype is a machine that uses a typewriter style keyboard to set the type where the Gutenberg press, you have to put the metal letters in the line and then press it as we've seen. Uh, the linotype actually transformed the publishing industry by allowing someone to type on a keyboard style to move all of those metal letters into a line. And this is actually how a lot of newspapers developed. Here's an example. The linotype itself revolutionized printing. It's called a linotype because it makes one line of type. Instead of the old cumbersome method of setting type by hand, you're instead able to sit at a keyboard, type as fast as you can, and compose type that can be printed from. It's one of the most complicated machines I've ever seen, and it's one of the most fun things I've ever been around. The linotype machine changed the world. The way that this machine transformed information it's probably its most significant achievement. This whole thing in this newspaper age, it was a calling. It was, it was something bigger. It's like a love affair. <laughs> I spent 35 years working for the New York Times, and uh, that was my life. So linotype machines were primarily used for newspapers because it allowed for uh, those in the actual press room to be able to type out their copy. Um, so after a journalist would write up their story, then the uh, press room would actually sit there and do the linotype uh, to be able to create the press for the next day. So that's where we get the term the press from. Now, modern publishing obviously looks quite different. In 1910, there was a peak of new titles produced with uh, 13,000. However, the industry really slumped between 1910 and 1950 with the development of other technologies. But today, uh, we have 2.2 million titles that are published per year. So you can see how rapidly modern publishing has changed. It's also interesting to note that two-thirds of all books written are actually self-published. So uh, publishing houses are no longer the powerhouses that they used to be. Uh, but those self-published books often sell fewer than 250 copies. So the best sellers, the one that makes make the most money, those are the ones that uh, the publishing houses usually get behind and sell. Now, 81% of people say that they should write a book. Uh, so if you're one of those people, you can obviously use self-publishing, but it's best to work with a publishing house if you're looking to make a career out of it. Another influence of the modern publishing industry, of course, is celebrity book clubs. Oprah's book club was uh, one of the first to introduce reading as a lifestyle on television. 